Hey everyone, enjoy the show. Back about 40 years ago, I started uh, buying and selling antiques. Primarily back in the day, I started with uh, antique gambling equipment. Uh, slot machines had became legal in about 1974. Uh, I decided that I was going to get kind of get in that business because there was some money to be made. Me and my brother used to get in the car, five grand in each pocket, hit the road, absolutely knowing nowhere we were going to go. We always started in the bar. We had no clue what we were going to do. Get a beer, start talking to the bartender, befriend him ask him the question, hey partner, you know anybody in town that's got any slot machines? Uh, if the guy kind of liked the way you look, he'd say, yeah, you know what, I got a couple at home. Take us over the house, negotiate a nice deal, put them in the car, we're down the highway. Uh, I suppose it was at that time that I actually really got hooked on this business. I mean, there was just so many aspects to it. I got to travel. I got to meet so many interesting people. And I ain't talking about just normal people because I dealt in the gaming stuff. So this was the underbelly per se of antiques, right? This, these are some real rounders out there that I was dealing with. And the reason that I'm in this business is for that reason. I get to build absolutely beautiful stuff. I get to sell it to cool people. I get to buy it from cool people. It's just everything is right about this, you know, and I suppose that's some of the reason people buy this stuff is because it brings back memories. Uh, the stuff does tell a story. Some of these machines you see behind me are absolutely crazy what these things have done, right? So it's kept me in the business forever, 40 years straight. I've been doing this. I build a good product. I sell it at a fair price. I give good service. I don't mess around. And I've, I've developed, I mean, hundreds and hundreds of customers. And I, I take good care of everybody. 40 years, you got to be kidding me. You know, I'm one of these cats that uh, I have to really enjoy what I'm doing. And I really had uh, the great fortune to be in some very interesting business uh, before Stumbling into this opportunity, I spent 25 years in the video game business uh, and the coin-operated amusement side before all the home stuff came out. And in 1982, landed my first job with uh, Bally, back when Bally was uh, primarily a video game company, a pinball company, before it got into the health clubs and casinos and so on and so forth. And from there, I just was at the right place at the right time and was able to me to become uh, employee number 82 at Nintendo. Uh, I was the vice president of Gottlieb Pinball. Uh, I brought Street Fighter II into this country through Capcom. I had the fortune to work for Nolan Bushnell at Atari and uh, always had something that was, it was a fun job. And so when this opportunity came along and I met Jim and organically just like we find our product it was through craigslist and here's some american picker type of dudes that are looking to get their product to market and they all own flip phones and they they don't really want to deal with ebay and they're not really texters and so on th so forth it was an opportunity for me to take my expertise and my my history of of dealing with uh, non-commodity products that are fun and and translated into this and uh and selling this product it's been very natural for me and very very interesting and I think what I enjoy as much or more than the products it is the people I'm selling to. I'm selling to very interesting people, um, actors and investment bankers and farmers and construction people. It really doesn't matter. I've gone from everything from helping a guy decorate his office to a guy completely doing a converted uh, a car dealership that is now a man cave. I mean, how great is it? and really feel that we're providing them a service that in this business, although it's been a long, a long time, really hasn't been to this level of you know, offering videos and teleconferencing and chatting and so on and so forth and developing a relationship before the products even ship. So I couldn't ask for a better situation. We run the gamut. I mean, we deal in anything that is cool and that people want to have. This is not a stagnant place. I mean, we're picking, we're bringing stuff every day, in and out, in and out, in and out. We're, we're, we're shaking and baking, man. This thing's gone. So if you want to buy something, then, you know, if you can afford it, you should just grab one of them or two.
One of the fun things about collecting is changing your collection periodically. I've seen that through the years with several of my customers. One of my customers, Tim, out of Colorado Springs, started as collecting 50s goods. However, once he met us about three years ago and started seeing the genre that we sell, which is primarily from the 1800s to about 1940s, immediately he got the bug and he started buying stuff from us, as well as he started trading in a lot of his 50s stuff. So today he has built himself an outstanding game room from the periods of about the turn of the century to 1940. Well, wait till you see what he's done. Married 43 years, four kids, two boys, two girls, two great grandkids, one's a five and one's two. Well, for years, my dad was a pretty ordinary guy. He was worked in a grocery store and he'd buy a lotto ticket every week and he'd say, when I win the lottery, what I'm gonna do is buy some acreage and I'm gonna give enough money to each of my five children and they're gonna build houses out there. Now, he uh, thought that was a pretty good idea, but I'm not sure all of us thought that it would be that good of an idea <laughs> to be living that close. But anyway, that was his dream. Never happened and when we got lucky enough, sell our business, that we bought a 88 acres right outside of uh, Denver, Colorado, and we decided to name it Morseyville. Started with uh, 88 acres of ground. We had our, our 1950s little gas station. That's where all the cars were parked. At one point we had 22 muscle cars. Had a cigar shack out in the woods. A little log cabin, it was a lot of fun. Had a water wheel that we built. At the time I thought it'd be cool to have a couple old fire trucks. And, they were fun, but then we had to have a place to put them, so we built a gymnasium and tried to make it look like an old armory back in the back in the day. Kept the fire trucks there, and then we'd pull them out, and that's where we'd play our basketball games. And you know, I sat behind a desk for 25 years, and I decided when I had the opportunity to retire that I was going to learn to do something, and went through a period of working with builders and building buildings. Then uh, that evolved into I got to put something in the building, so. Primarily it was 50s, that's what I got started on, lots of 50s machines, and it, it, it's finding the stuff. It's, I've kind of gotten out, when I started with the 50s stuff, I decided I'd restore the stuff myself, and that evolved several years ago. In fact, after I met you and uh, Jim Schaefer, it evolved, and now I want to do the cast iron, I want to get back to the turn of the century stuff. And uh, it's heavy, it doesn't matter, cash register, they built stuff they built good stuff back then, and so I don't do as much piddling with the machines anymore, and I, I guess I like to just sit back and look at them. Never had a big desire to show any of my stuff. It's, uh, it's uh, just something that we get satisfaction out of. It's all pretty neat stuff. And as I looked through it, I found myself, as much as looking at the items you were doing your videos on, I was trying to see as much as I could of the background of your showroom and it was quite impressive and I thought you know I can make that happen and what a cool place that'll be just to sit around and if I smoke a cigar or two it, it's a, it just seemed like what I wanted to happen so as you know that's turned into a, a real project over the last several years of, of getting rid of the my 50 stuff and turning everything into as much as I can I, I wanted to have the feel of an old bordello and that lasted long enough until uh, Diana, my wife, heard that that's what I was designing. <laughs> and uh, she said, you, you can decorate any way you want to decorate, but we're not going to call it that. So I don't know what we call it. It's, uh, it's a few of my favorite things. I want the club look. I, I guess that's the old world. Probably my, my favorite two machines is match machines. The old match machines just intrigued me, as well as uh, the trade stimulators. It's, uh, they're just neat. Well, everything I know I learned from Jim, and that's, that's a pretty sorry statement. But I'll say this, and I guess this is a plug for you guys, but I mean it, is my advice would be make sure you know what you want to do, because I literally spent tens of thousands of dollars buying things, thinking, you know, this is what I want. But I learned very quickly, it's easier to buy them from you guys. And the one thing that you do is everything comes out perfect. And it was a hard lesson to learn 
because it sure seemed easy to buy something and say, I can make that look with like Schaefer stuff, and I couldn't. So that evolved, I got rid of all that stuff, and I primarily buy the stuff from you. The best thing I always can say is that uh, I like things that are old and in great shape. And like I said, I've been married 42 years. Today we're over here in Pasadena, California at Roger Kisslingberry's house, who is the uh, foremost antique slot machine for the old single wheel slot machines around the turn of the century, as well as Roger is the author of this beautiful American Saloons book. So let's go take a look. So I, I was always wanted a Victorian. A little kid, my folks would get the uh, New Yorker magazine. There'd be Charles Adams cartoons, and there was always this old house in a lot of the uh, Charles Adams cartoons with the Adams family. And I said, "Oh, I got to have an old Victorian." Well, I finally found this place back in the '60s, and it was available in 1970, and I bought it and uh, made it my home, and been here with my family for over 40 years, and then. Uh, Put my shop here in the basement, and I'm just basically living in my in my hobby. Is what I'm doing. I'm bluffing my way th through life. <laughs> they haven't caught up with me yet. <laughs> wow! Wow! Oh, 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 oh. oh my my! How nice! <laughs> what do we have here, my friend? Well, I don't know. I just call this the Teddy Roosevelt room. It's just a compilation of things I've picked up over the last 40 years. So tell me a little bit about the Rhino Head, Roger. Oh, when I started a restaurant about 25 years ago in Pasadena, I got a lead on some material in a basement over at the old LA Athletic Club that had been there since the 20s, and they took the stuff down in the 60s because it was politically incorrect, right. and it was all stored there, and the guy said, basically, get it out of here, and I went, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So I have to have a rhinoceros head and the Cape Buffalo. Wow, Roger. Woo. Tell us about these two uprights you got over here. One on the right is a Mills Dewey uh, musical. I got that about 1968. Came out of a little bar back east in uh, Colorado. And the other one is a Cayley Big Six. Not only is it a Big Six, it's a Big Six Special, which has three stops per color, very scarce. And this is an original litho wheel, which is even scarcer than that. So it's, it's pretty unique. There's very few of those out there, very what, few. What do you think this sold for new, Roger? Probably around two hundred dollars, one hundred seventy-five dollars new. That was a that was a lot of money back. It was about nineteen eight, nineteen six, ten, right in there. What'd you pay for it? Four hundred bucks. Four hundred bucks. <laughs> Bought it in nineteen sixty-eight. Wow. Yeah. What do you think it's worth now, Roger? I turned down sixty for it. So there you have it. This is a nineteen thirties man cave. I mean, this is this is what they were doing, right? Smoking cigars in here and drinking fine booze and shooting some pool. Yeah. Absolutely killer place. Well, maybe you ought to go downstairs and I'll show you a saloon that might uh, get Let's you Let's do it. I've heard about that saloon. Well, there's a small admission fee, but we'll make oh. an exception <laughs> in your case. All right, cool. Let's do it. Let's okay. go check it out. Oh, yeah. Here we go. This is, this is, this is where the elves, the elves appear. Wow, what a neat shot. And uh, this is my... Uh, this is a faux electrical panel. I need this up to look Oh, up. okay. That's... <laughs> yeah, really. You got me. Oh, speakeasy. Oh, look at this, huh? This is kind of old-fashioned. You, you might like it. Wow, what a beautiful Fourier. Speakeasy. I couldn't afford a time machine, so I built this. What's the hand thing? Cigar lighter. I think these are... Oh, you got lucky. Well, you just light your cigar. Yes. Yes. A lot of the old cigar stores had these gas lights going continuously. They'd just be on all the times, you know. And the guy could light his cigar. Isn't that nice? That is awesome. So he's got a cigar in his hand. How cool is that? Beautiful. Oh, this is killer, killer. Wow. <laughs> oh, 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 Roger. Wow. I figured it. I figured you might enjoy it. Oh, my God. So was this? Dug out. We were this originally, the, it was this height. It was dirt. This is all dirt in here. Just brick walls and dirt. We took 130 yards of dirt out of here. So it went down, have the height. You gotta have moose clearance. Right. It's the law. It's the law. It is. You gotta have Bang Bellamy, you gotta have moose clearance. Anyway, we dug down and then all these walls are shot created, eight inches of concrete shot on the wall, rebar, footings under the house. I mean this this was a six-year project. This is over the top.
That's the first stuff hit. I was about eight years old when I got that one. My folks went up on a trip to Canada. We, my dad was a train nut. We took the train up to Canada and the Canadian Pacific. It was a wonderful trip. And they were off touristing, and I was getting all the junk stores. I was eight. I've had that thing for 60 years. And it was probably 50 years old when I got it, probably out of the 20s. Wow, look at your bar, Roger. Wow, where'd you get that? Got out of Texas, but. 10, 12 years ago, I had the storage and just the right size for this room in the vintage 1890s. I see a, a really rare trade simulator down yeah, here. Yeah, this is called the California. It's made by Whelan Novelty out of Portland, Oregon. There's only two or three of these known in the collector's world. They're very rare, they're about 1905. What do you think this sold for new? Oh, I'd probably sold 15, 20 bucks, I would, I would say new. 20 bucks. Back then. And today, there's only been two or three sold, and I, you know, you can't really put a value on it. It's probably worth somewhere between thirty to fifty thousand, somewhere in that category. Uh, Twenty bucks to thirty to fifty thousand. Yeah, that's a heck of an appreciation. Yeah, yeah. Even over one hundred and ten years. If you live to be a hundred years old, you can cash in on it. <laughs> exactly. Uh, we have here is a Mills Cricket, made by Mills Novelty, and they were out of Chicago, and it's basically a nickel that uh, goes down on a pin board. What you do is you put your nickel in, work your handle here, which drops it to your shooter. Pull back this, the nickel flies. There are pay indicators here. If a nickel happens to catch on the side of either one of these, it will pay out on the corresponding bin underneath this. But it's set up in such a way the odds are practically zero to win anything. Cricket bounces around. And then the counterpart made by the Cayley brothers in Detroit was called the Bullfrog, which was a same type of machine, but they call it the bullfrog. And bullfrogs eat crickets, which is kind of ironic. But. Mm -hmm. So what year is this, Roger? This okay. machine was built by 1905. 05. Yeah. And what did this sell for new, approximately? New was probably about $100, $80 to $100. And now they're worth about 30, 35,000. Crazy. 35. I paid all the $500 for this one years and years ago, and it was about killed me. Now I know what this is. This is a walking cooler just like we had at the Delta Sigma Phi house at West Illinois in the 70s. Yep, this is an old walk-in cooler, refrigeration unit you could say, but it's run by ice originally, but uh, now we have it on electricity obviously with an evaporator. These doors here for reaching in to grab product. And as I mentioned last time, there's another door which I may allow you to go behind. Now remember, I get to kill you after we show it to you, but okay. it, it's, wor it's worth the trip. Where is the door? Oh, there's the door. Come on in. Nice. Holy crap. <laughs> Look at this. You dug oh, this all out. Oh, my, my. Wow. 1920s machine. Yep, these are all 1920s Mills goosenecks. God, those are nice. All original. Yep, kept them original, not restored. Which one do you like the most in here? Well, there's a penny poinsettia over there that's kind of scarce, but this is one of my pets here. It's a 50 cent uh, and with the original patina, it's a half dollar. And then these are scarce. There's very few out there. And has the original paper and award card, which is very unusual. I like it when they got the rounded glass. Yeah, the, the early curve front. This is, yeah, this is early 20s. Yeah. Probably 24, 25, something in there. Nice. This, I call this my 1920s room. This is the modern edition of the saloon. This is where they say the Capone gang came out here in the 20s, bought the house, ran a speakeasy and had their gambling room here. Yeah, it's just, it's amazing. I, I would say this is as good as any museum I've oh. ever been in in terms of your, your display and, and accuracy and everything. And it just, well, I try to make the details correct. You know, I try to feel like if I walk back in 19, you know, 12, what would this bar look like with the evolution note from 1890? And anyway, you want to come outside? I'll, yeah, I'll show you the, uh, I'll show you the, uh, we're going to kick out of the bathroom. Yeah, it's not transgender, but you can still use it. <laughs> That's great. Thank you. <laughs> It even smells 19.5 in there. Oh, it's perfect. <laughs> Dude, amazing. Come on, Jeff, you gotta see this. I don't go in uh, bathrooms with other men. You, you, they will make an exception. Look at this vintage journal. I know it sounds funny, but this is absolutely killer. Probably right at the turn of the century. This beautiful door, oak. This is just... I know it's funny to get excited over a restroom, but this is so period. I mean, the sink, the trap, you know, the actual plumbing at the bottom of the sink is all exactly period correct. There's no reproductions here. Everything is God, he's real. going nuts over the bathroom. This is <laughs> totally cool. 
This guy has just done a spectacular <laughs> job. Yeah. Hey, Jimbo, how was the party in there? Did you, oh. did you have a good time? <laughs> oh, it was lovely by yeah, myself. I'm sure yeah. it was. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. You're welcome. <laughs> Is he something now? He's, he's a great cat. Oh, yeah, he's the greatest yeah. cat. I love that cat. I got him at the pound. He, he's almost 17, you can believe it. Wow, wow. He looks he's good. in good shape. He's in good, good. I restored him last year. <laughs> <laughs> he did good. Yeah. Right, Rocco? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Rocco. Thanks for showing me around. This is fantastic. Oh, my pleasure. Hey, let's go get that upright mech out. Oh, You've yeah, we got, got that duo. You've got, got work some on. work to do. Let's go. That's right. I've been goofing off all day. So, folks, we're on our way over to Roger's house, which is the fellow who wrote this book. One of my favorite books of all time. Uh, we're going to be offering them here through the Mantiques Network. I highly suggest you get this if you like coin up and the old west and saloons so let's run on over there and see what he's doing so roger listen i want to thank you for sending me this book out uh you know i really appreciate and admired your first book this being the second one i know you told me your first book is completely sold out and now they're collectors copies and they're going yeah, for more money it's right? funny my first book saloons bars cigar stores i had five thousand uh, printed i did uh and i sold out and now you can get on amazon and there's some nuts out there that are asking 13 and 1500. whoa i'm not book. i'm not kidding get on amazon look up saloons bars cigar stores roger kissing bring you see people asking the book isn't worth that it's worth by the 100 150 bucks you know yeah but they're and, asking and for big money yeah so, so I had to do a second book. Yeah, I've been collecting these photos for years. I had some left over from my first project, and I picked up a lot since the first book, which was 15 years ago. And I thought, it's time for a companion copy. So I put it together at the first of this year, and you got the copy of my new product. I love your books. I mean, me being a aficionado and a lover of the Old West, this is... For, for the people who will purchase this book, it is one of the greatest coffee table books in the world as no, far no, as I'm it's concerned. It's a bar top book, not a coffee Thank table you. book. Thank you. Thank <laughs> ah, you. Hopefully they hopefully it inspires him to get a bar. <laughs> yeah. Right? I don't know how many people have a beautiful bar exactly. like this. Exactly. And the but, one about the I love my taxi, that big dog. Boy, that's one damn big dog. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like this. But it's just everything in here is just stunning. All of the coin op on the bars. Yeah, that's what I really uh, focus on a lot is the early gambling machines and cast iron gambling machines on the bars and the floor model slots. There's a number of pictures in here, quite a few, that show those at the time, at the original location, the way they would have looked had you walked in a bar in 1905. I've bought some photographs over the years which are really quite expensive these days. However, what you've done here, I mean, this book is, has to have uh, $25,000 worth of photographs you're, you're in it. Probably close, yeah. Right, easy. And then people are going to get to enjoy these photographs and they don't have to buy 25 grand Oh, yeah, grand when I have worth. a lot of photos, sometimes I get in competition with other collectors and you can go three, four hundred, five hundred dollars for one photograph. Oh, if, exactly. If it's got the elements that, that really uh, spark your interest. And folks are going to get to just uh, have this book and enjoy the photographs just like we would have paid the There's, big money uh, for There's over 200 photos in here, uh, and uh, they're large copy photos, and uh, for the price, you, you're looking at pennies, pennies a page. Totally. I love this book. And for you folks out there who want some, uh, some history here, this is the greatest book, and I suggest you try to get one before they sell out. Like you said, his last ran sell out. I appreciate you letting us all in uh, here my today. Pleasure. I'd like and, to share it with somebody that appreciates the same things I do. It's, oh, this is it's nice. And the book, we'll get some of them gone. Thank you Great. so much. Thanks, I appreciate Jim. it. Appreciate Thank you. you visiting. Right. Thank you. So today we're going to run down to Costa Mesa and see Greg and Tony. They bought a couple of really, really cool slot machines from me. Break a little bread, have some conversations. It's going to be a lot of fun. Hey, Jim. Hey, Greg. How you doing, buddy? Good. Hey, we're here to Good deliver to your slot machines, there we dude. Go. And some more. Another exciting day. Yes, yes some more. <laughs> uh, you picked a couple of beauties, so maybe we'll Thank just you. go ahead and get them off and try to get them in here and get them All in. Right. Why don't you show me where they go first? Yeah. So we know where we're going. Yeah, I'd like to uh, put the new cabinet here, and then we can put the Rockola on top of that. Okay. So I wanted to keep it low over here. I hate to be Captain Obvious, but <laughs> I have to ask you about Burgermeister now. 
Burgermeister was my family's business. Oh, wow. Founded by my great-grandfather in 1868 in San Francisco. San Francisco? Yeah. Uh, over the years, the brewery changed names several times. It was uh, Bay Brewery as it was founded, Milwaukee Brewery of San Francisco, San Francisco Brewing Corporation, Golden State Beer, and eventually Burgermeister Beer. But that was the original brewery there, and that's my great-grandfather, that guy. Oh, man. Oh, that's cool. This is definitely the 20s, the Model T's. Right. This is the 40s, this picture here. And then this was the, the last rendition of the brewery. How cool is that? Wow. And now the, they tore it down, it's a Costco parking lot. Costco now. They sold it to Schlitz. They couldn't compete with the big guys, right. the Anheuser-Busch, the Coors, people like that. It was strictly a West Coast beer. Changed hands three or four times, and then in 72, it was gone. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. What a nice, uh, what a nice print too. Yeah. Where'd you find the print? It was my dad's. So it's been in the family. Yeah. So you've had that. All of these pictures. Oh, oh how cool! Yeah. So you didn't have to hunt them down. This is all from. Yeah. Your pop. And this used this picture of the Burgermeister used to hang in the in the uh, boardroom and at the brewery. <laughs> I remember being in college and when you at the end of the semester when you ran out of dough, you started drinking Schlitz oh, beer, yeah. Falstaff. Old Milwaukee, and if it got really bad, I'd be putting tomato juice oh, in yeah. it just to get it down the get it down the hatch, right? And it started helping you with that hangover Something the next really morning. Yeah, I tell you, it, it yeah. worked yeah. Yeah. <laughs> for sure. What's uh, what's the story behind the lighter? These are actually match seeds. Match, match, okay. And uh, it was like in the old days before lighters, yep. um, they would put like their wooden matches in them, and a lot of the pieces were advertising pieces for guys' taverns or saloons or liquor stores or cigars. Because you're using a match quite a bit, right? So yeah. it would be like a wallet or just a way to Just a way to protect the matches. They've all got strikers on them, on the bottoms. And it also was a status symbol, the nicer your match oh, yeah. holder was, you know, the more money you had, or, you know, it was just an object that you could put on the bar, et cetera. And he's got some killer ones here. If you're looking at them, right, you know, Golden Wedding 10 cent cigars. And I know that we talked about this last time I was here. These things get into some pretty serious money. Oh man, huh? I'll say. Huh? They've got them for thousands of dollars. I mean, gold-plated ones and diamond the stuck original in original ones. Yeah. Exactly, because if you were like Diamond Jim or something, you'd have a there custom one made. I mean, you'd <laughs> go down to a match safe maker and say, put my initials on it, put diamonds yeah. in it, put rubies in it, make it gold. Yeah, I love the ones with the bar scenes. I like, ask your support against prohibition. Yeah. <laughs> All right, let's go get the slots. Perfect. Come on out with me. Jim, what's the year on that one? Mid-30s. We saw one in a book, 37, and they called it Club Bell. Club Bell. Uh, this, this one they called a Club Special. So, and if you, I, I was looking at one in the book as well, where here it had the, uh, with the symbols of sports with the bat. And, uh -huh. You know, they had another one, so. I like that one, it's nice and clean. Oh, this is gorgeous. It goes with a silver chief. Goes with my Maynard Dixon. Maynard Western. Dixon, there you go. Yeah, no, this thing's beautiful. Is that okay? Yep. Why did they start building these, these uh, club consoles and what was the purpose of them? Um, you know, these, basically, these club consoles were made for high-end clubs. Okay. Private clubs, it would be like, they would use them in the USOs, in like the Elks clubs. Pretty much private clubs. You really would never see one of these in a casino. Looks like a piece of furniture. Oh, it is a piece of furniture. Yeah. That's what, you know, I always try to find consoles because they're so beautiful when they're refinished. I mean, it's in its own yeah. built-in stand. This thing's absolutely stunning. It's a beautiful piece. And when I sent it out, I made sure they did it in the original three colors, mm -hmm. the mahogany, you know, and the light wood, as well as the black bottom. All of this was put on at the factory to screw it on in the back so every piece came off. All got refinished separately. What is also very cool is they got the hidden cash box, which is as well spring-loaded, so you could just let it go. Cool. It's got a full double jackpot in it. Uh, everything about this is just absolutely beautiful. It's a nice, solid running machine. Come on. Come on, pay out. You're making money today. Anyway, absolutely beautiful machine. So, you're kind of good to go. Okay, beautiful. All right. Coin front roll the top, Thanks man. Again. Okay, let's go. Wait a minute, what's going on out there? Let's go, Jeff. Okay, Jim. Yeah. 
And here's the rest of the collection. All right. Oh, dude. Check this out, boys. Wow. Huh? You're holding out on us, my friend. <laughs> you are holding out on us. I told Avita you. Avita's saying. Fantastic. Wow. A lot of these signs and then clocks and things like my dad had. All right, my car thing's taken over. Give me the rundown on the GMC. I have a picture here of my dad, myself, my brother, my sister in a truck, GMC truck that my dad used to bring home from the brewery on weekends. Company vehicle. Company vehicle. And we'd all jump in that and we'd go take a run to the dump in that thing. It was exciting, you know, cruising around with my dad. So I said, when I retired, I wanted to find a truck like that. And I did, I found it on eBay. It was in a museum in Sacramento. It's basically the truck that, that I bought and uh, I just did the lettering on the doors. Well done. Tune up and uh, away we go. 1953 GMC. Fantastic. That thing's cool. And what, what do we have here? This is a 1921 Model T Ford Speedster. And uh, this was my dad's car. You're kidding me. Really? No, he bought it from a fellow in Northern California, up in Pacheco. And I, got, I brought it down here in 1980, drove it for about a year, parked it in the garage, and didn't touch it for 30 years. When I retired, I got it restored. That's the story. Can I see that? Sure. Push that pedal all the way down to the floor. That's first gear. You take off running. You, really, you let go of that pedal. That's in second gear. You got two forward speeds. And this pedal's your brake. If you want to go in reverse, you put that pedal about halfway down, and this center pedal is reverse. That's how you drive so this. So you probably thing. weren't using high heels uh, to drive I a vehicle. I barely like get this. my feet in there. <laughs> I mean, I I mean it's, exactly. that's got to be tricky. Oh, yeah. Huh? You got to pay attention. If you used to it, you better, no kidding. You got to pay attention when you're driving this thing. It only goes about 35 miles an hour. But uh, perfect beach. A car. lot of fun. Yeah. I mean, you know, living uh, two cool. miles from the beach. Well done, yeah. too. Nice restoration on it. Beautiful. Love the burger thing. Man, you got some nice pop outs here as well. That's the first thing I bought from you. Remember? Oh, okay, that's right. Out of the store, I had Burger Pops out. Yes, the Mallards. At your shop in Tustin. Yes, remember? yeah, exactly. I love those pop outs. Yeah. And you notice the majority of them are all uh, dogs hunting, fishing. Right. You right. know, because it was a man's thing, right? Oh, yeah. No ballroom dancing, none of that. No. Gosh, got some great trout ones. Those are killer. Man, you got the good stuff. You have absolutely done a wonderful job of amassing the burger stuff. Here you got another one of these guys. Yeah. 99 cents. Fill it in, right. 99 cents. Whatever cents, you want. Right? Yeah, special of the day. Yeah. Got some more reverse glass up there. You guys hungry? Yeah, let's do it. Let's head on in. A little something to eat, boys. Well, again, I really appreciate uh, the time uh, coming over to take a look at your place. We're having another series I was telling you about with the storytellers. Uh, sessions and we love to have you guys come down sometime with one of your favorite pieces obviously a Burgermeister piece sure. and also share uh, your, your stories behind it. I think it would be fascinating be my pleasure fantastic this morning we're on our way down to Dana Point to deliver this beautiful cast iron fan which a longtime customer of mine has purchased, as well as this gentleman has a huge collection of orchestrian organs, which he's gonna share with us today, so we're on our way. Good morning, man, good morning. Come on out, I'll show you your oh, new okay. fan. Okay. The wife's gonna love this. Yeah. Oh, this thing is, uh, as you know, the reason you bought it is it's just absolutely stunning. It is, isn't that cool? Yeah. You're just going to love this thing. Do you know the history behind these, these fans? These were made in um, Ohio, and what they were doing, as you know, back in the day before air conditioning became uh, common, is people would go to movie theaters to cool off. Got it. Well, then it got a second application that wasn't really what the factory was looking for. Well, the funeral parlors found when you put this fan at the head of the body, it did two things. One is that the amber glow from the lights made the face look a little bit better. It gave a little bit of color to it. And the fan kept the flies off the body. Most important. Most, <laughs> Most important. important. <laughs> well, the story is that the company was so distraught that it was being used for that that they stopped making them. Wow. So here we are. Was, uh... Hence making your fan rare. Yeah. 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 Well, let's take it in, plug it in. Right over there between the two music machines. 
I can feel the flies leaving already. Can you feel the flies leaving? <laughs> <laughs> you have Jack and Cabra, I'm chilly. All righty. Yep. Thanks for the purchase. I always appreciate your business. Hey, thank you. All right. It's got a good prominent place. Amen. Yeah. So uh, show us around a little, Mike. Let's start over here. Okay. What you're looking at, built in Belgium by the Decap Brothers. This was probably started in 1927. It lived its first part of its life on a merry-go-round. This it's, it's a merry-go-round organ. It was converted into what it is now, which is called a Dutch street organ, which they're very popular, and they're still very much in vogue in, over, over in, in, in Belgium and stuff like that. And you'll see them on the streets, and the people hand crank them typically. This one's got a motor on it, so, we can, so I'm not back there you know, busting in a gasket trying to keep it going. But everything of this type, everything in this collection, they're all pneumatic. There is no speakers. There is no amplifier. What it does is it's actually playing itself. It's actually playing the instruments. In this case, the pipes and the percussion, and the bells and everything. The whole provenance of that organ is displayed against that wall. See, this is it on the streets in Belgium. Mm hmm Well, we're going to hear some noise now. OK, get ready. This is a Mills Violano from the Mills Novelty Company, the same people that I'm sure Jim is very familiar with, with the slot machines. Oh, yeah. And they... several other trade machines, coin op stuff and everything. They made about 4,000 of these all together. This is, came later in the run. This one, again, is like the other machines, but it uses electromagnets on it. It's not air powered, and it's very unique. There's not too many machines that did that. That's what Mills was known for. The machine does everything by itself. It self-rosins and, and does everything. These were used in a lot of different settings. You know, restaurants typically, but even in the bars, you know, ice cream parlors, just about anything where a group, a gathering of people would be. And the common term for these is, once again, a coin op. They're nickel grabbers. These are very desirable machines, very well thought of, very well wanted. Almost all of the collectors that are do what I do and everything, they all have one of these. And um, there's, this is a standard model. This was the most standard model of this machine they made. They have different classes of them doing the same function. Fancier cases, some of them are double violins and stuff, and they're rare and they get, they get the coin for them. This is the machine everybody sticks their head inside of. Because you can, you can see what it's doing, you know. It, it, some of the stuff, like the big organs and stuff, I mean, you, you, you know what it's doing and everything, but you can't actually see the mechanics of it making it happen. Exactly, and to watch it play the violin yeah. so beautifully like that, it's just Yeah, it's so just they're, they're, they're great. And uh, Southern California, you really are in a, in a real strong area for a lot of collectors of, of these type of machines and stuff. When you own something like this, or this, and, and the other stuff in here, you own it and it's neat to show it off, to do what we're doing right now. But you gotta realize what this is. These things were made back in the 20s. Some of the stuff was made in the 18, 1890s or, or in, in that. You get to own it and that's neat, but you're a caretaker for it. And sometime, this moves on. You want it to. That's right. So would you guys like to hear, see something else? Yes, yes. Let's, let's move along. Okay. Do it. Where is this? Is this the R? Is that the R I sold you? I knew you'd remember it. So you're pushing, you know, in that 20-year range. This kicked it all off. This is the first item that came into this house. It actually had a prominent spot in the living room. And it is my wife's baby. 54 Seberg R, second year of high fidelity. Wow. Yeah. It yep. still looks as good as the day yep. you bought it. Yep, it I mean, you've kept it up just absolutely yep. perfect. 20 years, you'd, you thought you'd just pick well, this it, up. it was a good piece from you, Jim. So, yeah. you know, it speaks for itself. Yeah, exactly. I remember that one. That's Jim, is the really warranty pretty. still good on this thing? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah, absolutely the warranty's still good. All right, moving right along. Yeah, so 
you'll notice all the merry-go-round uh, figures and everything. This, this white horse here being my pride and joy. That's a real hand-carved uh, merry-go-round horse. It's called a churny horse by the carver who did it. It's from 1910. That rode the merry-go-round at Knott's Berry Farm in the lagoon, which was the carousel across the street behind Independence Hall till Bud Hurlbut, the owner of that carousel, sold it off for auction in 1990. It went to the Anaheim Convention Center, and he got real melancholy about selling, and a lot of these animals he kept. And this one was in his office. So the general public got to sit on that piece of art? Yep. <laughs> for yep. a nickel? Yep. And over there is the ticket sign that rode that rode oh. with that merry-go-round. Oh, that's fantastic! From the you lagoon, got that. from the lago lagoon side. Forty-five cents. Yeah, and this the brother of this lion right here still rides the merry-go-round at Knott's Berry Farm today in the main park. If you look at that lion, it's the exact same one. That's wow! A, yeah. that's, what a beautiful. What piece do we of have art. here? Well, now we're now we're going back into the bar scene of Belgium. This. This lived in a bar in Ghent, in Belgium, and it's called a jazz organ. It's a decap again, like the big, the big Dutch organ. You know, the machine's been gone through, so it plays wonderfully and everything like that. But if you study the, the facade, you'll see burns in the case from cigarettes and everything, and it's just all part of it, all part of it. So we'll fire this bad boy up. Mexican music player. That's what all this is. The story that's really neat about these, these are from Belgium. These were in bars in Belgium. 39, what was going on? Right at the start of World Get War II. Get ready for World War II. Right in World War II. And Germany's taken over. They take over Belgium. Right. There's a good chance a bunch of Germans sat in front of this thing. Right. Drinking. Right. During the war. And then you, you fast forward, add three years onto that or four years on it, the Allies are kicking their butt and pushing them back. The Americans and the so Brits and whoever sat in front of these same machines and listened to them drinking beer. Boy, that's fantastic. That's, that's, that's a, a that's, piece of history. That is. That's, that's very fantastic. cool. And so it's out of a bar in Ghent. So, very nice. you know, moving on from that, this is a Link style E, and it's called a marimba because of the, because of the marimba bars in it and everything like that. There, there's a few of these around, relatively rare, great machine. Great machine. This one's in great shape. It's a great part of the collection. Behind you is a Cremona K. Very beautiful, very ornate machine. And this is one of the rarest things of the American Nickelodeons. This would be the rarest machine in here. There's probably eight of these that exist. It's got 66 pipes in it, along with a, a full 88 key piano behind it. You smell it when you opened it? Oh, yeah. yeah it's got it the just, smell. It yeah. just. And Cremona uh, was the Marquette Piano Company, and they were known for their quality. These guys, for American machines, were the Rolls Royce. All their chests and everything are all out of mahogany. All the insides are, are bird's eye maple. And like the Seaberg and the Wurlitzers built <laughs> wonderful machines. They just didn't take it to that next notch like, like, uh, right. like Rolls Cremona did. Rolls Royce. Yeah. Mercedes yeah. Rolls. Yep, yep, yep. Great machine, very rare machine. And, and back to this machine for a second, you can see this is a, a, what they call an endless roll. It was one way of thinking how to play music because there was no rewind needed. So it was constantly, constantly taking nickels. Where these have rolls that have to rewind and, and they lose two or three minutes. The one thing when you bring up the iPods and all that kind of stuff, you've got to figure all these machines in here all use a variation of what I'm showing you here. And Jim knows it well. Oh, yeah. It's a version of a piano roll with all the perforations through it. All these machines, like an iPod, like a computer, they're digital. They're on off, the on off, on there's off, the on off, on off. Like we can remember from our, the IBM cards, everything sure. like that. It's the exact same thing. It just did something different. So you guys brought up tractors. 
Tractor, yeah. Wow. Yeah, we're, we're tractor this. collectors here too. The Red Baron. <laughs> yeah, that one's it. small enough, I can keep it in the garage here. 1957 Farmall Cub with a few few little aftermarket stickers on it. <laughs> That's cool. Some of them not too politically correct, but you know, oh well, well. This would have been the equivalent for a one horse farm. With the cars I own and stuff like that, I mean, the cars are cool. I love them and everything like that. But I'll get more people, I'll drive this around the neighborhood, typically on like a 4th of July weekend or whatever, just like today. I will get more people that'll ask me about the tractors and everybody's got a tractor story. Everybody remembers about how their uncle runs off a farm or they spent a weekend somewhere and they all drove tractors or this and that. Okay, this is of the cars. This is the newest in the collection. This is a 1923 Model T runabout. It is the basic little car. This was their basic car. You know, this is, you can't get much more Spartan than this one. And uh, yeah, if we move on yeah, to the other side, what we got here, friends, <laughs> it's a hot rod, but it's a 1930 five-window coupe with the, with the chop on it, you know, the quintessential California hot rod. Well, I, I love cars, but I got to admit the, the machines inside the house, are the, those are what make me tick. And I cannot turn on one of those machines and not smile at it. Hey, you guys hungry? We got some... Some homemade chili in there. We got a lot of cold beer to go with it, too. I'm going to have a little bit of that as well. <laughs> Film crew's been drinking the whole time anyway. Hey. Mike, I can't thank you enough. This has been a, an absolute treat here. Your place is uh, uh, its a trip back into time. It's a museum <laughs> in itself. And uh, I think you've got more organs here than Belgium ever had at any one time. It's fantastic. Well, you guys are welcome. I'm glad you came because... It kind of reverts back. If you got toys, what good are they unless you play with them? Amen. And I'm ready to I'm ready to show them and play with them, 24/7. Anybody great. wants to, you know, take the time and I got plenty of nickels in there, so we can play everything again and again and again if you want. And the home's open to them. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank, Thank you. Much. I look forward Thanks, to it. It's been you a bet. Pleasure. You right, bet. Thank nice. you. Mr. Cotton's shaving parlor is my dream. And um, it's taken five years to accomplish, but the vision of this store came to me um, with a sad part of my life when I lost my brother. Um, like everyone, you lose, I don't know, focus in life. So first the loss of my brother, the birth of my daughter, and now the store. Uh, we're here now, everything was set up for this to happen today. Okay, that I just wanted your name, dude. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> My name's Anthony Reyes, um, general contractor for uh, the build out on Mr. Cotton's project, shaving parlor slash museum. I wasn't, it wasn't clear to me on really how he was bringing this all to life. Building a, a barber shop inside a museum, inside an old photography studio. And this is where I took my high school pictures over 35 years ago. Everything was a problem. Um, the building is so old and uh, so many hang-ups. Uh, the designer had problems with the blueprints. The blueprints didn't match what the city wanted. The city wanted ADA compliance. Uh, none of the ceiling joists lined up. None of the floor joists lined up. The electrical was shot. It's a roller coaster. Uh, it didn't work out the way I thought. Um, I had another place just in Uptown Whittier. They canceled the lease. Again, I was sad of roaming the streets and I found this place in Whittier Boulevard that was just a dump. It, was, it all began over a phone call and in uh, his patience because uh, I wanted sushi that day. So I made him wait like another hour for me. Finally, the day has come for us to deliver Mr. Cotton's product. I helped him with this. He thought he was gonna get this done in six weeks. Here it is four months later. Today's the day. We're delivering a whole bunch of just really neat stuff. Uh, Jim and Jeff are here dropping off uh, my purchases. They walked me through some of the things. They made sure I didn't step in too deep of a puddle um, and uh, help me help me get everything put together. Jeff, how are you, sir? Hammer, how are you doing? Just checking out your ride here, brother. It's I, beautiful. I left it open just for you. Well, of course, you know, <laughs> I got to keep doing our business here because that never stops. But, uh, <laughs> wow, this is fantastic. Yeah, car sir, show. how are you? Mr. Cotton, how are you, brother? All so right. Here. Come on, guys. Let's get inside. Oh, wow. 
brother. What do you got going on here? Um, I have some chairs, obviously 1910, Congress. The other one, 1953, 1853. You're gonna get full service, it's gonna be the haircut, the, the hot towel shave. You're gonna get massaged, they're gonna do your nails, clean your shoes, and before you walk out, you're getting sprayed with the best cologne Europe has ever produced. So a guy coming here getting quaffed. Yes. Exactly. Younger people are gonna come in here and be uh, take a trip to the past, and older people are gonna come back there and take a trip to their past. And I'm telling you right now, you're following it through right in the store. This is fantastic. That's what it's all about. So the barbershop, the um, experience, it takes it un the, to another level. Like I told you, I got some inspiration from the brick wall that you did with the saloon doors. Yes. I always watch that video on YouTube, just so you know. So as soon as you come about two, three inches, slot machine, trade stimulator. The slot machine that has the vintage copper where Jim lost some skin, that one's gonna be so um, time correct, it's gonna look amazing. And talking about that tin, we go to the ceiling. I wanted something to tie it in and I didn't wanna go with uh, regular uh, fake ceiling. I wanted something that was time correct. Now, where my artistic side comes out is uh, I needed to get spackle and I needed to cover the walls, the seams, the bricks, the screw holes. everything, the screw holes, everything. Because we need, we need to straighten out this wall. The walls were, took hours and hours that I didn't anticipate to get them straight enough to, to, to actually apply something to them, you know? The joicings, that's what Anthony calls them, uh, were not straight. So this guy's hanging at two in the morning on a Sunday. I was at home sleeping and he told me it took him eight hours to do. Uh, I felt so bad for him because <laughs> I want to relax, you know, I'm, I'm relaxing Sunday. This particular unit is the only unit with a crawl space underneath it, which allows this floor to get that hollow sound. The rest of the units are on slabs. So that played a big role in it too. Whenever it comes to um, the person feeling, touching, sensing everything, it all comes down to that first time, that first impression you get. So when I have somebody walk in and you feel that the floorboards are loose, that is intentional. You know, it's just a matter of getting the correct materials, right? And putting it up and a little bit of extra TLC to everything. And you know, this Patience. is- Patience. Yeah, and hard work. Very, very cool, dude, very, very cool. So let's see uh, the barbershop. So tell me why you divided up the gaming room from the uh, shave parlor here, because it looks like it's a totally different attitude in there. Okay, what I wanted to do, when it came down to the clients coming in, I didn't want them to think that there was anything going on in here but a museum for the shaving from 1880s all the way to 1960s. So when they walk in, the first stunner is you look to your right-hand side and wow, it's an, it's an old building. It's, you know, it's wood, it's rough, it's got the, the old hanging light on the outside. Again, when you guys come back, it's gonna have the barber poles, uh, all the wooden ones, no light. It's all the way that it had to be back in the day. All right, let's go inside and check it out. Come on in. Wow. Wow, wow this is nice, dude. There you go. Three stations in here then? Three stations. The chairs hold up to 800 pounds each. Uh, they're even, they're over compliant for California. I want everybody to be able to enjoy themselves. One, two, three, black leather. And now obviously look up, white tin. The counters are custom made. So everything fits the time period. Everything was little. All they had was a lot of bottles. You'll see the bottles once it's all done. Um, and you're in another world. Everybody outside can't hear you, can't see you. Well, that's what I was kind of thinking too, is kind of like a, the same guest experience as a massage where the actual act of your shave is in a separate room. It's, it's a little bit more intimate. You can get to know the person that's giving you yeah. the shave. And yes. That's personal. where the conversation yeah. going on. Those guys can be looking in there going, I want to get a shave. They're looking out there, I can't wait to go out and play. <laughs> yes. So yeah, yeah, yeah. really, uh, it, it, well done. Well done. You, you pulled it off. I mean, this is not a huge building, but I've been sitting on your stuff over in my store for six months waiting for this place to get I'm open. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. It just took a little bit longer than I thought, but. I'm so glad you're here and can't wait to get the stuff out of there. Looks like you guys got it covered. I'll stay back here in safety zone. You lose all the way down there. This is Christmas time.
you want, 10 cents? Oh. I, don't want, I don't want a second time for cotton stuff. If you don't bleed, you ain't doing nothing. Ah, oh, yes, the music machine. I wish I could help, but I'm not union. All gold, folks. This is all gold. Open up the speaker. Thanks, cool. Oh, yeah. It's a shame to take it out here because they hit that every occasion with everybody in here. I think we get another one. I don't know. We can get another one. Yeah, we can get another one. Want to go in? So you go that way? Because that's going in first. That first guy's stay. We're thinking about there. There. Yeah, right there. Go, there go. You go. go, 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 go. Down. Down. Here we go. There you go. That's about right, right there for the moment. Mm -hmm. Yeah? Mm -hmm. yeah? Yeah? Let's go get the last piece. Let's last go. one, let's go. Yeah. yeah, let's get the last piece. Push. Of Hold <laughs> on. Wait here, Jeff. Yeah. Wait just a minute. If you need a wooden, hey, if you need a wooden Indian, I, I think I could fill the role here. Right, it's only fair on the oldest here. To pull, I get to pull the dolly. Okay. Okay. Hold on, hold on. Okay. Good. Perfect. Now. Okay. Watch your fingers. Everybody out. Nice. Wonderful. Uh, it looks nice. Yeah, it is. What a nice counter, huh, man? Look at all these drawers. It's They're, an some are double counter. deep, right? Yes. Well, that's one of the reasons that what's, what caught my eyes is that you can put the display and you never lose the display. The counter is from the 1920s. Everything was made to last. And when you guys come back, you guys will be blown away. I have prototypes. I have straight razors, safety razors. I don't think it's going to fit in there. Nice. That, I don't that, that, think it's going to fit. But it's going to be the history of barbering the way it, it, was, it was always a career. It wasn't the cool thing to do. It wasn't to get tattooed and go ahead and shave my head or no. No, it was a career. You were a surgeon. They pulled bullets. Uh, the doctors actually would watch the barbers perform the operation. They never got their hands dirty. So there's things that have been lost, and that's the whole thing about the barber poles and everything and blah, 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 you know, the whole story. Well, it all started with um, a shave that my dad, uh, he passed by my, re my restroom and he saw me shaving. I had horrible ingrown hairs, so he decided, uh, hey, there's this fat boy that I bought you when you were 17, you never used it. So what I did was I used it, maybe a week, all cleared up. Epiphany, the flashlight went off, and I thought, wow, you know, this could help out a lot of people, not just myself. Men don't know how to shave anymore. It's a tool. So that's where it uh, escalated into the barbershop, where I thought, why can't we have what women have, the spa day? Okay, there's a spa day for men. If I can put, put take, take what I got inside me and, and, and create something for somebody else, that's, there's a lot of reward in that, you know. Your life is waiting for you outside that door. I'm not taking it away. I'm just enhancing your, your experience here. So, can't wait for you to come. Well, really looking forward to coming back and see Herbert's vision all put together here. Very encouraging, very exciting here. So, that's a wrap. Looking for that classic straight razor shave? Come down to Mr. Cotton Shave Parlor on Whittier Boulevard in Whittier, California, where you'll be surrounded by vintage games as you wait inside their museum for your manicure, shave, and shine. Mr. Cotton Shave Parlor returns a quality and service from the past to give you that authentic 1880s barbershop experience. When we want to shave and cut, we only come to one place and that Mr. Cotton Shave Parlor. So come on down and be pampered in a vintage setting under the care of our master barbers waiting for you. Five freaking years and we're finally here. I'm so excited. I can't wait to show my collection. I can't wait to show how everything turned out. These guys are just gonna shit themselves when they see the place. Wow. Mr. wow. Mr. Cotton. <laughs> Gentlemen. Mr. Cotton. Joe Lear. Joe Lear. Holy crap, Herbert. Okay. You did a good job. Wait, wait, wait a minute.
this isn't just your regular haircut dive place. No, this is your barbershop. This is an 1880s barbershop experience. Joe and I, first thing we walked in said, that's a very familiar smell to us when we walked Pinald, in. Pinald, 1910. Told you. There you go. <laughs> that's the stuff right that's there. That's the stuff right, right there. Yeah, the I green. have it there. How much do I owe you? That's our it's air amazing. freshener. It's amazing. It's amazing. That's oh, our true. air freshener. Oh, You're fantastic. gonna just see everything. And then I hope you recognize this one, Jim. Oh yeah, the trade simulator. The very Ferris fair. wheel cigar <laughs> trade simulator. The Ferris. Very Ferris good. Alone. Let's give this a little whirl here. So you know how this works, right? Is this was a trade stimulator which sat on top of the counter in a cigar store. When he purchased a cigar, he would put a nickel in this for a nickel cigar. More, this has two and three and two on it. So we came up with one, so we got our cigar. But if you hit number two, you would get two cigars. And if you hit number three, you would get three cigars. So it was guaranteed one cigar. You were buying a cigar and having an opportunity to win more. And because we didn't get another cigar, that's where the saying uh, comes from. Close but no cigar. Close, Close but, but no, no cigar. cigar. Exactly, right. and it came from these specific machines. Yeah, I think people forget that you know back in those days you're not plugging anything in, oh. so everything is uh, mechanical and dealing with weights and balances, and well, that's really cool. No, that's a great trade simulator. I, those go out as fast as I can get them. My straight razor collection. Nice. Those are my babies. You know what this would do, right? Oh, it'll take your finger for sure. Oh yeah. In the old days, I mean, this that is looks what like a, bad guys would carry. Like a cleaver. <laughs> well, it looks like a surgical uh, instrument. It's yes. just precision. It so is true. surgical. So when you come on down, you have the pool table. We're not just going to be looking at razors and so on and so forth. And then we come on we over can here. Use that while we're getting ready for a shave. Yeah. That's, that's right, the that's objective. Right. That's nice. the whole point. Three by seven. So over here, I moved the slot machines. They're back here now. Hey, uh, why'd you set up the ropes? Well, he's smart to have this up here because he can't let people put their own coins in these machines because if he allows somebody to put a coin in here, that's illegal, that's gambling. So what he needs to do is when his patrons come in, if he would like them to play these machines, he needs to hand them up, uh, some coins. For and amusement they, only. For amusement only. And then they can play all they want, right? And if he chooses to let them take the winnings, he can because that's giving away money. But you just simply can't pull your own money out and try to win some money. That makes sense, yeah. Anyway, that's kind of the legality on him being in a public public place. Is this your razor collection you've been telling us about? Yes, I have. Wow. 75% of it is here. It didn't all fit. Where did you get this from? Oh, from all over. New York, Alabama, Denver. Start hunting them down, different antique stores. And uh, I didn't look enough to Foreign find. pieces too? Yes, uh, there's actually large collections in Japan, China. Yeah. Germans are the ones from Soligen uh, that make the razors. Interesting story, the Canfee brothers are the ones that invented the safety razor. But I have also a Chevette style straight razor, which the wedge blade is actually removable. That's, again, early design. I think there's only three known to exist, and I have one of them here on display. Nice. When did men start shaving? Actually, it, goes, it dates back all the way to Egypt, where um, the pharaohs were shaved by, obviously, a peasant with a gold straight razor. Oh, interesting. Makes sense because they, they were all clean shaved well, yeah, in the they, movies. They were, okay. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> in the movies. <laughs> then you come over here. But the Eureka is one of the companies that was sued, one of the first ones sued by Gillette for copying their design. When I think of Mantique's network, I think of these two pieces. <laughs> yes. And one day Jim told me, he said, you walk into any major player's office and you have that or that sitting on the desk and you know that guy. You're collecting. Yeah. That's it. You know he's legit. He's like, I just, after the big high dollar man, they go, could you tell me about this nice little thing here? What is that, right? Oh, you're going to put the finger in there, not a problem. Yes. <laughs> very, very nice. Great stuff. All right, guys, come on in. Oh, nice cotton. Yeah. There you go. It's like a different chairs world. worked out, man. The chairs, they're the 800 pound ones that I told you about. Memory foam. Joe, you're gonna fall asleep. I, I, can, I can feel it. <laughs> well, we got this chair ready for you. So wow. this is my master barber, How you doing? Mr. Cortez. Nice He's gonna take care of you. Joe Lear. Let me get the other guys. Joe, this is Krista, Miss Cotton. This is Kevin, Mr. Lara. Nice to meet you. Yeah, so I'm a year into collecting, so it, I've made more mistakes than, than I've had wins. And working with Jim and Jeff and Mantique's network, now I'm in my comfort zone. I have a better idea of what I'm doing, and I'm really 
What's up, Joe? Yeah, you know. Hey, that's right. fascinating, Joe. So, right. Please tell us more. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I was watching the, uh, there was a, a commercial for the NBA or something out there, and they were Ice-T and all those guys are talking and debating who's the best player. Metal Lock Lemon and all stuff. But it reminds me that the barbershop was much more than just a place to go get quaffed and cut. It was a place to come and discuss politics, religion, and sports all the time. You probably didn't know, Joe, that uh, Mr. Cotton here has been associated with boxing as well as I know that you are really? associated with boxing. Yes, sir. I've been in boxing 20 years deep, buddy. What do you do? Well, I worked for the Boxing Hall of Fame before I expanded onto this. Um, I was actually uh, there when um, Don King was inducted. I think that was what? I think it was 95? I've been working with Don King since 1996. Oh, I As a matter work. of fact, when I did my first boxing tattoo, I don't know if you're familiar with the Golden Palace tattoos. Bernard Hopkins wore it first when he beat Felix Trinidad. Yes, 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 I remember that. Well, after that I was banned from every casino in Vegas. I couldn't show my face anywhere and I had the First Amendment on my side. <laughs> wow. And guess what, I won, I won the right to do it and the result was millions of dollars went to boxers and I got the greatest experience of my life to work with them. I'm still a part of boxing. I do a ton of sponsorships. In boxing, you have promoters, managers, trainers. I'm basically the only agent that's ever really been out there and just getting sponsors and doing stuff. But with the World Boxing Hall of Fame, and you're talking about in Canastoga, New York, right? Yes. That place is absolutely, if you were there when Don King was inducted, that was a huge one. Uh, actually, the one that I was involved in is the one from here from LA. Okay, I've been to the LA one several times with Jim Lampley and Bernard Hopkins. There you go. Yeah, they do all the presentations over. It's phenomenal. Yes. Tell me some of the stuff you've done with uh, the Boxing Hall of Fame. I, I was the one that was promoting the um, human resources. I got to meet a lot of boxers. I was there at the events where they inducted the, the nominees. I've done oil paintings. I also do that on the side. Really? Wow. I didn't know that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'd love to see your work and I'd love to introduce you. Joe, take a look at somebody I've worked with. That's mother... Wow! There you go. Wow, that's serious. I've actually seen some of your work then. There's some. It presides in Mexico City. Yes, it does. <laughs> it does. And that's where you had me make it, so it all Oh, you? I, hey, I guess so, because it was on the wall. I travel, exactly. Wow. That was cool. <laughs> there's two types of champions. There's a real champ and there's a belt holder. And I've dealt with both. And the real champs have helped me become a better person. It's just so inspiring and working in boxing and, and everyone who works in boxing, I mean, it's almost like that's their last shot on earth. And to see what they make of it is, is absolutely amazing. You guys are a union, right? <laughs> Did they have unions back then? <laughs> Great job, folks. I gotta tell you guys, like a lot of my friends say, hey, you get to work with pro athletes all day, go to gyms, do that. Yeah, but I couldn't wait on weekend to come do this. There you go. <laughs> you know, and, you go. and a lot of the things, people will see pictures that I'll post, and they'll see, I'm like the man next to the man, right? Um, and, I, and they love it. But when I go to your, do I go to your showroom? I, I like to sit and work there all day, you know, like, it, it's all relative. I think what you guys do is the coolest job on earth, and I think you're an extension of that. This is just great stuff, man. Thank you, Joe. That was a hell of a shave, too. Thank you. Thank you so much, brother. <laughs> no, I'm going to stick around and have a hot dog, though. Of course, you, know you guys. I mean? You got you your people coming in. Stay here. Really nice. Please do. Yeah. Please do. Joe. Awesome. awesome. Well, we're finally done. The boys got their haircut. They got their shave. They're ready to go. They're out the door. Now it's your turn to come on down and have that 1880s experience over here at Mr. Cotton's Shaving Parlor. Can't wait to see you. have here? It's a 1930s Penny Arcade strength tester. Cool. Are you strong or weak? Test your grip, which immediately says to a bunch of drunken guys in a bar that we need 100 pennies right away. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I came down to the shop today to sell my 1930s Gottlieb grip tester. Anybody that had a penny could walk up to this device, squeeze as hard as they could, and measured how strong they were. I'd like to give $1,500 for it, but We'll see what happens. We'll have to negotiate as time goes on. This is really cool. 
These things were in penny arcades, they were in bars, there were a lot of different places. Gottlieb, as you know, was uh, very instrumental in introducing the flipper to the pinball, so. Oh, yeah, well, he was, he was the first pinball. The guy. first, yep. But this was an amazing, cool machine. Right. During the early 1900s, Gottlieb made a lot of simple coin-operated machines. Not only were these things popular back in the day, collectors loved them now. But the condition of this thing has me a little concerned. Okay, um, does it work? It works pretty good. You got a penny? Yep. I sure do. And now you just squeeze it? Yeah, give it a squeeze. You did it. <laughs> You're a man. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so this is, uh, it's pretty neat. How much you want for it? I was thinking like two grand. Ooh. It's a little out of the ballpark. Okay. What were you thinking? Okay. I'm thinking closer to 400 bucks. Oof. Um, these things right here go for 1,500-ish in beautiful, wonderful condition. And it needs a lot of TLC. Okay. Would you do a grand? No. Because there's, there's no money to okay. be made. Um, take 500 bucks for it. I could do seven is the best I can do. Which means you could do six. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I think so. <laughs> so 600 bucks? We'll do 600, Rick. All right, sweet. Yeah. All right, let's go up front and uh, we'll do some paperwork, yeah. man. Perfect. Absolutely love this machine, but it's seen its better days. So I'm going to get Bob in here and see if he can work his magic. These are antiques. These are mantiques. Antique, mantique. These guys sell mantiques. This is their store. We're picking, we're bringing stuff every day, in and out, in and out, in and out. We're, we're, we're shaking and baking. These are their customers. Give me the rundown on the GMC. This lived in a bar in Ghent, in Belgium. Follow Jim and Jeff from nine to five or after hours as they buy, sell, and restore the coolest stuff for the coolest collectors worldwide.